we really believe that this is the word of God. And so we're going to hold up our Bibles and everyone together, why don't we declare this? This is my Bible. It is God speaking to me. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. So I open my heart today to hear God speak a word that will change my life forever. And Father, I ask that indeed your words would be heard and that indeed hearts would be open to your voice and that my voice would matter none and that my thoughts would matter none. And I submit myself once again to you. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. This morning, we're going to continue in the series that you have been in, the end time revival. Today, we're going to talk about healing and freedom. And I want us to turn to Matthew 4, verse 23. And let's read here where it says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. So Jesus, this encapsulates Jesus' ministry. He went about teaching and preaching and healing. Often when people are asked about Jesus' ministry, well, what did Jesus do? The first thing most people will say is he healed. And he did. And he does. But the scriptures tell us that that's not all he did. And he didn't just go about healing everybody. Healing, healing, here a healing, there a healing, everywhere a healing, healing. Although he healed. <laughs> that's not how it looked. He went about Galilee and everywhere he went teaching and preaching and healing. He didn't just heal. He taught. Two of those three things that the Bible says, and, and in Matthew 9, actually, we're not going to turn there, but it's the parallel to this, and it says the same thing, that he's teaching, preaching, and healing. Two of these three are oral communication. Teaching and preaching. Honestly, even on my way up here, it's like, well, can't we just show up? And can't you just, like, heal everybody? Like, just break out? I mean, come on. As a, as a person who comes to ministry, I mean, you know, you want to be the one that it just, like, oh, they all just walked out healed. And, and the Lord was kind of like, yeah. But you're going to need to teach and preach so they believe. Jesus had to do it. Why would it be different for anyone else? We have been called to the ministry of Jesus. And so we must teach and we must preach and heal. Teaching, just to kind of explain the difference a little bit between preaching and teaching. Teaching would be explanation, explaining how it all works. Preaching would be proclamation. Declaring something you didn't know. Speaking it out. Preaching. And teaching is explaining it. Similar to like when I got saved, born again. Heard the gospel. Jesus died on the cross. Forgive my sins. Pro the gospel was proclaimed to me and I believed it. And I was born again because I accepted Jesus as Lord. But I needed some explaining to ha be, begin to happen to me. Now, I was born again right away. But over time, as my behavior and my circumstances would quickly show, I needed some teaching because I didn't understand all of this. And I didn't understand it inside. I didn't understand that because of the blood of Jesus that I was the righteousness of Christ. Now, I believed I had accepted Jesus and was going to heaven. But because I didn't understand that his righteousness was now mine, that I didn't have to measure up, and I was already the righteousness of Christ. Now, as I began to believe that, 
I began to act more like that. I began to really believe that. Some of you in this room may know a little bit of, um, I say my testimony, but I feel like my many testimonies, and I don't say that like, oh, because I'm so great and had all these breakthroughs. It's like, no, I messed so many things up. I made such bad, he's like, yeah, hey, who told you? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> it would be true. They would be not lying. So, uh, so many mistakes. So many bad decisions. Because I did not understand. I had believed in God and I was born again. But I was not taught who I was. And so although I was born again at... Uh, young and then rededicated at 18, on fire for God, loved God, knew I was called to ministry, knew it. I don't know how I knew it. God somehow through the scriptures was able to download that to me. I mean, I just knew I was going to preach the gospel, but I was not discipled. And so although I was passionate and excited, it wasn't enough. This would be a great place to me mention, again, OSL. It came up earlier. OSL, Operation Solid Lives. There's a reason why we offer this discipleship system in all of our churches and beyond our churches. In fact, there's people visiting here from Las Vegas today. They're not a rock church, but they do OSL. It's how we know each other. And, well, kind of, we know each other. We met in Israel. But they do uh, OSL. This discipleship will transform your life. And without it, you risk destruction and just going through things you didn't need to. So at 18, although I was excited about the Lord, knew that I would preach the gospel, just without discipleship, not understanding who I was, I met someone and I got involved and I got married to someone completely unequally yoked. And although I know that God can heal and turn things around, it did not happen that way for me. And seven years later, divorced in just a mess. And frankly, I believed in God and I knew God, you know, hates divorce and all the things I knew. And, and I wanted this divorce. I'm not going back. Like, I'm a mess. Not understanding, not being taught drove me back to sin Addiction began going out and drinking and, and smoking weed and becoming entangled again with pills and things like this. Now, this is a person who has accepted Jesus, loved God, believed that had a call on my life. But without teaching sound doctrine about who I was, would make choices that would lead me to destructive paths. But God. Oh, again, the grace of God comes. As if it were not enough that it came to save me. Came to redeem me. Pursued me to restore me. Began to speak to me. God truly just began to speak to me. I, I'll never forget it. I'm a, I mean, I'm a mess. I believe in God, but I'm a mess. I've got three kids. I'm divorced. I'm partying. But inside, I believe in God. I know he's real, and I'm thinking things like, how are you going to fix this? Because we all know I don't know how. I'll never forget walking, just not even with it on my mind, walking across my living room, and I hear a voice inside. Say, I remember you. Oh, I broke down in tears because I knew it was him telling me, I remember you when you were just you before all this, before all this mess, before the divorce, before you were a mom, before you got in. I remember how you loved me. And immediately, my heart spoke. You ever do that? Your heart speaks. You're not even in control. Like my mouth didn't say it, but my heart responded to him and said, I'm afraid you'll make me go back. 
because all I knew was law. All I knew was God hates divorce, and so you got to stay in that horrible marriage, and it's abusive, but you stay, you know, just. And the Lord just said, stop asking me for forgiveness for something I've already forgiven you for, and why don't you ask me to forgive you for marrying someone I never gave you permission to marry? And in that moment, I was free. I realized that I had judged him wrong, that I did not understand the goodness of God, and that I needed him to lead me. And I just began to turn back to him. Thank God he led me to sound teaching church, uh, church on the way, and um, Pastor Jack Hayford began to teach me and restore me. And through that broken time, still very broken, still very frail inside, my husband laughs about that, and he's like, yeah, people don't believe you, like that you were frail inside. I was. I was very broken. But God began to say things to me, crazy things. They sounded crazy, like, you are mine. I have redeemed you. Your husband is the creator of the whole world. I mean, he just began to breathe these words out of the scriptures over me. What was he doing? Preaching and teaching. Why? Because he wanted to heal me. The ministry of Jesus. We see it when he walked on the planet. He went about preaching and teaching and healing. Let me tell you, the ministry of Jesus is just as alive and well today as it ever was. He's still doing it. He does it by his spirit. He does it through his word. He does it through you and through me. We who carry the spirit of the living God, we go about preaching and teaching and healing. He still does it. I stand before you, a healed woman, a whole woman, restored in body, soul, and spirit. I could never begin to convince you of the level of my brokenness. It would take too long, and it would just sound ridiculous. It would sound like I'm making stuff up. So broken. But God came, and he began to speak words, communication, oral communication, the word of God, hearing preached message, faith came by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And it began to change me. And I began to believe this stuff. I really began to believe this stuff. Like the shame of divorce, especially if you've believed God and and grew up in the church. And I mean, I'm not sure how, but it becomes like the scarlet letter, the thing that it's like, Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit can't be forgiven. But that's not true. That's a lie. It's just one more lie that keeps us from becoming who we're called to be. We are born to be in God's image. And Jesus came and redeemed that. And we are still called to be in his image. We are the bride of Christ. So from brokenness and divorce to the Mrs. Jesus Christ. He said so. This is why we need to be disciples, preaching and teaching. And Jesus knew that. He went all around. He knew that they're going to need to, I'm going to have to convince them. I'm going to keep speaking to them. I'm going to keep telling them. I'm going to keep saying it. Oh, and someone in this room is thinking about someone they know that they've just continued to tell them how much they need Jesus and they don't listen. And don't give up. Even though they reject you, even though they say, oh, not that again. No, I won't go to church with you for the thousandth time. Don't give up. We continue to preach and to teach. And what happens is eventually just enough faith hits them to say, okay, I'll go. Or wait, Jesus wants to save me? The power and the simplicity of God's plan is astounding. Words. Words that come. 
the ministry of Jesus is still going on today, both through his spirit and through us. We need to be taught. Why do we need to go to OSL? Why do we come to services? Why do we listen to the word? Because we need to be taught the truth. Your experiences, your upbringing, the results of all your decisions have preached a message to you that is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It always turns out bad. Nothing ever works out for me. That is not the truth. All things work together for the good of those who love God. And he will turn it around. I can't begin to express to you what it feels like 18 years, 18 or 19 years later to be, oh no, it's been longer than that, 20 something years, sorry, I'm older than I think. Um, I'm married again now, almost 18 years. To be remarried in a 18 years of solid marriage, to be in a ministry movement like The Rock, I mean, God redeems. And when the devil told me, you blew it. Yeah, you did have a call on your life, but with all that you've done, it's done. You'll never preach the gospel. No one will ever listen to you. You will never be what God called you to be. Well, not so. Because the blood of Jesus is so potent. It's so potent. You know that every negative thought, every thought that works against the truth of who God says you are is not so much attacking you as it is a, an affront on the value of the blood of Jesus. So I want to remind you of something or preach something to those who never knew this today. Maybe for you it'll be the first time. And for some of you, maybe you've heard it, but let me teach you something today. Every time, every time you doubt, will God do it? Don't think you're just having a conversation with yourself. Don't think this is just your negative thoughts. You are in front of the courts of heaven. Heaven and earth and hell are watching you. You are a witness for Jesus. And what you respond to that is your testimony. The blood of Jesus has purchased you. And it's either powerful enough to completely transform you and make you into God's image, or it's worthless. And though none of us would say that out loud, that is really what's, what's being asked. Can God? Yeah, God can. Will God? He will. And he has. He swore in blood that he would complete what he began in you, that he would not leave you behind. And I feel compelled today as I'm here. It's like I'm here to beseech you to don't listen to your own thoughts like they're yours. They're not all yours. And even most of yours are not trustworthy. I know this. There's thoughts that come from three places. From God, from myself, and from the enemy. The myself ones usually are related to my experiences and, and upbringing and all that. I know this about those three thoughts. Only one category of those are trustworthy. God's. <laughs> Mine aren't, and the enemy's aren't. God is trustworthy. And since we know that, we know that what he says is true. We really can be who God says we can be. We don't have to cower in fear. We don't have to be afraid. Everything can indeed work for your good. And some of you I know are facing things that you're like, yeah, well, you, you have no clue. That can't ever be fixed. I'm telling you, he raised the dead. Talk about can't be fixed, right? I know, as for sickness, any sickness that's in this room, I don't care what it is, 
from the scratchy throat that I showed up with. <laughs> it's like, oh no, it's going down anyways. The horse voice, but that's okay. To AIDS, cancer, it's still not worse than Jesus dead, dead, yet God raised him up. It's that powerful. So when we begin to feel like, yeah, but, but my situation is hopeless. My, this relationship thing, this thing I've got going. So listen, stop. It is not more hopeless than dead. Yet God raised him. And that's why the Bible declares to us that the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in us. And we'll quicken, I, that may be old King James, you know, sometimes you start to merge like your past versions. Uh, well, make alive our mortal bodies. It's going to bring it back. So I declare today, sickness, you have no place here. The spirit of the living God is moving and being released today to make alive bodies, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. And the same healing virtue that flowed out of the hem of his garment, that very same virtue is released today to flow over your lives and your bodies. So we still see this, the method of Jesus. And if it was the method for him, how much more for us? Preaching, teaching, and healing. Some ministries don't believe in healing, so they'll preach and teach, but won't ever get to the healing. Some ministries want to just heal and skip the preaching and teaching. But we have an example in the Word that Jesus gave us. Preaching, teaching, preaching, and healing. And we see that he passed that on to us when we take a quick look at the Great Commission. In Mark 16, we see, starting at 14, it says, Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and just heal everybody. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, we see again another account of this same commissioning. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We have been sent to do the same thing Jesus was sent to do. Teach, preach, and heal. And we can't skip it. Some people like to believe that Jesus could just go anywhere and do anything and he could just heal anybody and okay this begins to be a little you can feel the tension in the room like what is she about to say? I felt it. <laughs> like she's about to say he couldn't do everything but we see and we're going to read a little more about it in Nazareth where it says he could not do any mighty miracles there. So apparently unless the Holy Spirit was inaccurate there which would be worse than me saying the other, so we're going to not go there. The Bible is true. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's profitable for doctrine. So we see that Jesus couldn't just heal wherever. And it seems to me that the place he couldn't heal was where there was unbelief, which is why, how can unbelief be overcome? Through teaching and preaching. It's the antidote. We have the antidote. Oh, that's encouraging me right now. I'm thinking of people that I've known for so many years and to the point where I just don't even like bring it up anymore. 
Like, I don't even invite them to church anymore. They know I'm a pastor even, and I don't even invite them. Is that horrible? That's horrible. But in this moment, I'm being reminded, no, I have the antidote for their unbelief. It's teaching and preaching. You know why that's really good news also in this room? Because when you come here to hear the word spoken and taught, and when you get into OSL and hear the word of God preached, the areas of your life where you're having difficulty believing God, it's like administering the antibiotics to cure it. You have the cure. We have it. Teaching and preaching. Jesus did it. The disciples did it. Unbelief can be overcome, and it's through preaching and teaching. That's why we're walking through this today. That's why. I believe this stuff already. I'll just tell you right now. So I really didn't have to come in here and convince myself. Well, and maybe I had the luxury of already it being preached to me. So I believe. But we need to walk through it. We need to make sure that we're being taught and preached at and listening until every area of your life submits to what God says. Instead of submits, by the way, you are a slave to something. I would rather be a servant of a good God than a slave to self or the enemy and sin. Sin is brokenness. Sin is not always just, uh, you know, overt horrible things. It's missing the mark. Accepting mediocrity in your life is sin. So some of you who may not have, well, I don't have anything big going on. I don't know. Do you have anything off the hook going on that's great? If you don't, then you may be missing the mark. God has called you to greatness. And we do that through preaching and teaching everywhere we go. In all kinds of ways. We want to be healed. We want to see the world healed. Free. That's why we preach and teach the word. Do you remember the two blind men from Matthew 9? Let's look at that from Matthew 9, 28. So there's these two blind men. And Jesus says to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened. According to their faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. They believed, and they were opened. Do you remember the woman with the flow of blood? I mentioned her a moment ago. Mark 5, 34. And he, Jesus, said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. I want (laughs) to, this was not in my notes nor my intention, but I I feel compelled to just be really honest with you that um, when we start talking about healing and faith, I think I must have like maybe a, a either a little issue I used to have that God has had to work on or something, but I, it comes up every time, and I'm just going to be vulnerable with you and share it here. God is good that way. He likes when we just put stuff out there because I'm willing to confront my own self. When we say things like, well, your faith, and it's your faith, and I think there was a time in times past where uh, some faith ministers would, you know, people would be disappointed because they didn't get healed. And people say, well, because they didn't have faith. And so then it was like, oh, great, you're putting it on the sick person and all that. So I think this gets a little, I don't know, maybe not for you guys, but I I just have to admit that there's this little part of me that's like, oh, you're a person who's already feeling the pressure in life. And then you're going to put it on them like it's them, like it's not God. And you know what? Unfortunately, yes, but, yes, but. (laughs) I know. It's like, oh, I'm conflicted. I'm being honest. Because my natural man is conflicted. It's like, God, you know, it's like telling the depressed person, come on, be happy, you know. And they're like, I'm trying. I, I mean, I'm being honest there. 
but I just got done talking about, but we have the antidote. We can help you get faith. So it's not like, well, you know, you didn't get healed because you don't have faith, so like you're out. No, you're still in. Let's explain more about the word. Let's let the word of God convince you of his goodness for you until the faith comes. We don't just give up because it didn't happen. We continue to do what the Bible said to do. Preach the gospel. Don't sit around and talk about why it's not happening. That's not the gospel. The gospel is the good news. I just had to get that off my chest. <laughs> just in case anybody else was thinking it and feeling like, well, you know, the other people are saying that. No, 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 listen. Jesus wants us to be very clear. He's trying to explain to us that we have the antidote. We can take the antibiotics, if you will, for unbelief. And there's no condemnation for having unbelief. There's, the only issue would be is if you refuse to take the medicine. Stop hearing the word of God. Stop being willing to be taught. When you're no longer teachable, you're in big trouble. That's when you're in trouble. Because that is really you saying, I already know the truth. So I don't need it. There's only, oh, I don't even know who said it, but I heard it at Anaheim years ago. It was a guest speaker, and he said, there's only one thing that can keep you from the truth. Thinking you already have it. No, it's, think about it. Because you ain't listening. At least knowing you don't know it all, there's the chance that it'll keep coming until you get it all. But if you think that you have it locked down on this topic of healing or deliverance, and when, by the way, when I'm talking about deliverance, let me tell you, addictions to anything, that's bondage. You must go free. As a child of God, you must go free. And I'm here to tell you, you can go free. I'm the evidence that people go free all the time. I, I am free. I am free from meth. I am free from marijuana. Years free. Decades Fully free from cigarettes. Anybody struggling with tobacco? Oh, here, I'm going to tell that. Uh, uh, <laughs> so I continued when I, when I came back to the Lord. You know, I continued to smoke a uh, couple, <laughs> couple things, but eventually they all started to fall off. But I was still smoking cigarette <laughs> and reading my Bible because, you know, really I had heard the Lord say, don't let your sin keep you from me. I died for it. So you just keep coming back to me. Don't worry about what you think and don't worry about how you feel and don't worry about church or any of it. You just keep coming back to me. So I would go to church and I would read my Bible and I'd sit out on the porch of my house and I would read my Bible with a cigarette. I know, so whatever. Don't act like nobody in this room has ever done it. No, <laughs> Maybe you haven't. <laughs> not that bad. Anyways, <laughs> and uh, that was not me giving a permission for people to like smoke. Because uh, it's bad for you. But anyways, my mom, I remember one day her walking by and she'd be like, how can you just sit there and read your Bible all this time with like smoke? It just, she just mentioned, I said, you know, God is more concerned about my black heart than my black lungs. And he will deal with it. He'll figure it out. And you know what he did? He did. Oh, and now I'm going to tell you how he did. I wasn't planning on it. Um... Finally, the day had come where I had kept saying, oh, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. I had, you know, like most people, tried to quit, like we try and quit anything, right? Any addiction. But self-control is not usually enough. It's not enough for total freedom. It may temporarily keep you out of trouble. So I'm not against self-control. You should use it. <laughs> Y'all should try it sometime. But what's better is freedom. What's better is being loosed from the power of something controlling you. And so although I had tried to quit other times, uh, at this point in time I had committed to my brand new husband that yes, when we get here, when, we, uh, when I move there, when we get married and I go there, I'm done, I'm not going to smoke. And um, so he was holding me to it. So I wasn't loving it, but I was doing it. I, I wanted an inside, but... The, flesh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh was weak. And uh, so I had stopped. 
And then one day, I don't know what was going on, I don't remember, but something that made me a little frustrated or irritated. Uh, I know, it's hard to believe that I would ever be frustrated or irritated. Um, but immediately I began to think, oh man, I need a cigarette. Like I'm quick, like I'm like, I want a cigarette. But it had been several weeks already. So I began to think, there's gotta be a cigarette butt around here. I know, like, <laughs> what? Like low, like desperate, right? No, I did, and, and I found one. <laughs> yeah, not pretty. Not my best moment. Not my, not, well, you know what though? But about to be, about to be. Oh, your worst and lowest moment has all the makings for your best moment. So it didn't look too good. I mean, do you see it? I'm like, it's a crooked cigarette butt. Can't, crooked and everything. I didn't even make it straight. Stale. Lit it. And I take, a, what are they called, a drag, a hit? I don't know what they call it anymore. Whatever. Puff. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, and as I do, I just hear this, these words in my head. And I'll huff, and I'll puff, and I'll blow down your house. <laughs> that didn't sound good. I just, again, there were just thoughts in my head. It wasn't like an audible voice, but it was just those words crossed my mind. And then I heard the passage from Proverbs, I believe, 14, one that says that a wise woman builds her house, but a foolish woman tears it down with her own hands. Now, remember, I have a cigarette in my hand. And then I heard the voice of the Lord, and he said, anger likes it when you smoke. And for the first time in my life, I realized I didn't like to smoke, that a real demon by the name of anger was influencing me and being pleased likes it when you smoke. I'm bringing pleasure to a spirit of anger, not a feeling of anger, because anger is not always a feeling. And in that moment, I knew I will never serve you again. And I put it out, and I have never desired a hit of a cigarette ever again. I was free. And you know what made me free? The truth. For me, for me, the attachment was a spiritual bondage to anger. Now, people who know me wouldn't have considered me necessarily angry, like I wasn't having outbursts of wrath. But the Lord revealed, you have anger, and this is the way you deal with it, and you're worshiping. And I, I, I look, I don't know. All I know is I was bound, and then I wasn't. I couldn't stop, and now I have no desire. 20 years later gone. See, the truth will make you free. But you got to get to the truth to know it. The word of God preaches to us. Someone in here who's been struggling with addiction, could be tobacco, could be chewing tobacco. There's no condemnation, but the Lord wants to set you free. Hiding it, dabbling with it, there's no condemnation. Jesus is saying, come to me, and I'll reveal the root, and I'll set you free, not just from the action, but from the driving force in your life. He cares about every detail. <laughs> I didn't get as far as I want to get, but we're going to move into this a little further before we get out of here. Let's jump over to Luke 3. Luke 3, 21. It says, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, you are my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. You know, I wasn't thinking about this till right now, but I find it very interesting that the father is preaching to the son. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Even Jesus needed to hear what the Father had to say about him. I had not seen that till just now. Listen, if he needs it, how much more do we need it? The Father is saying, you are mine. Sometimes 
If you're like me, you'll focus, uh, for me, the, the cross, Jesus' great love and redemption for me just blows me away. Like, I really believe I'm Mrs. Jesus Christ, because I am. Like, you cannot convince me I'm not. He loves me. This is my husband. You got a problem with me? Talk to him. I, I tell my husband that, my earthly husband. Mm, you gotta talk to him. He's got to compete. I'm like, you got to compete with him. He's so good to me. You got to compete. Come on. He does great. It is not fair, but it's fair. He said, it's not fair. It is fair because Jesus, that spirit of Jesus lives in him. I'm all, you got all that it takes. He'll give you all that it takes. You're the best for me because he will fill you and make you the best for me. So here we see the father preaching to his own son. Jesus didn't do all that he did because he was the son of God. Okay, see, these are the things in OSL. See, these take longer to teach out. But let me tell you, that is not what the word teaches. Just because he was the son of God, so he had all this power. No. In fact, in this moment in time, right here, where it says that the spirit of God descended upon him. We, he had never done a miracle before this time. He had never done anything special before this time. Wait, saving that he was sinless, the only sinless human being. That's pretty special. I'll give you that. <laughs> he was sinless. But what I'm saying is he didn't operate in, in supernatural power, healing, delivering anyone yet till this time that we just read. And then in Luke 4, we see this, starting at verse 1. Then Jesus, after that, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And although I'm not going to go into that, we know that he was tempted by the, the enemy and overcame that and then came out of that, verse 14. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out through all the surrounding region, verse 16. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Listen, this is not the first time that he had read scriptures in that synagogue. Because it says, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue and they handed him the scroll. So this is not the first time he's been there or read. And for sure, this is not the first time that the people in that synagogue heard this passage. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me. Like, this isn't brand new. He didn't write this that day. This was already written, and in fact, because we know that Jesus is eternal, and he has been here from before the foundations of the time, we know that Jesus said that the first time. The Spirit of God, through the prophet Isaiah, spoke these words. Jesus had a spo spoken it already, though they wouldn't know that. And in that moment, he walks in, although he's been there before, read there before, read something they heard before, but today something's different. Because today, what's he declaring? This is fulfilled. Well, wait a minute. Didn't, didn't we say that he's been there before? He's read there before, and they've read this scripture. What's different? The Spirit of God had just come upon him, what, about 50 days or 40 days before that? So previous times... Though they may have read it. He may have even read it. I don't know. But he never said it till this day. Today, this is fulfilled 
in your hearing. Something changed. They had heard the scriptures before. They knew them very well. But he was declaring, today something's different. Today this is reality. Today this is fulfilled. And for some of us, we've known the scriptures. We've heard the promises. And Jesus is saying, today this is fulfilled. Today is your day. Today, the word that you've heard me say before, but it's real for you today. Some of you have heard that you should be in no bondage and you should go free and you should be healed so many times. But Jesus is here today saying, but today it's fulfilled. Today. This wasn't a new word. It was a now word. And it's still the same word. We're going to be wrapping up in a minute. But let me show you something about this message. Jesus preached this message in that synagogue. By the way, they were offended. <laughs> they were offended. Who's? We know who he is. He's been here before. That's Mary's boy. That's James's older brother. So they thought they knew him, and they didn't, what do you mean you're, and, he, and he's like trying, like, no, 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 listen, I know, I know, it's me, but, but no, you don't understand. See, the spirit of the living God has anointed me now. I'm different now. This is what he's trying to tell them. Like, something's changed. I know that you know who I used to be. I, I'm not saying I'm anybody different, but what I'm saying to you all now is, this thing's going down. I'm the one. No wonder they were offended. Come on, think about it. Oh, but it was true. The spirit of the living God had come upon him. And he had been anointed to do all these things. But they were offended. And the Bible goes on to tell us that he, Jesus, could do no, no mighty work there. So we see that, that not that he would not, he could not. Their offense and unbelief limited his ability to do miracles. We see that he healed all over the place, but not there. Why? Unbelief. They were offended at him implying and saying that he could do this. Let it not be said of any of us or our households or our church. Acts 10, 34, we see something really interesting. This is Peter. It says, then Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no per partiality but in every nation whoever fears him by the way this is peter like you remember the guy who who um denied jesus was like ran like hid then he needed jesus to come and restore him which it, again precious jesus restoring us but this ain't this is now peter full of the holy spirit so remember jesus got the holy spirit came upon him and then he came out in power okay well this is peter after pentecost so it ain't, it's not the old Peter. He gets up and starts talking a whole different way with a whole different power. I, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Listen to this, verse 36. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace, through Jesus, he is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism with John, which John preached. Now listen, wait a minute, let me go back a second. The word, verse 36, the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus, through Jesus, they weren't running around preaching about Jesus. They were preaching through Jesus. He is Lord of all. 
that word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism with John preached. How God, so what's the word that was preached? How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Listen, I had not ever seen this. Peter is talking about, he said, that word, what word? The message that was preached when? After the baptism. What was that word? Have you ever heard that word? It was when Jesus got up and said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. So this word, Jesus went about preaching that word. Not just in Nazareth. He went about declaring, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He's anointed me. Like, I'm the, I'm the one. And then healing them. And then Peter affirms it by saying, hey, you know what was preached? That word which was preached, he said. In other words, you know, you heard it. It was preached where? All throughout Judea. All around. Because Jesus went what? All around preaching and teaching. What was he preaching and teaching? That the spirit of the Lord was upon him and had anointed him. You've heard the message. We read it today. My goodness, we're still preaching the same message. It's that good. It's, that's it. That's the proclamation. The, the Lord God anointed Jesus to be our deliverer. And he went out, yes, doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. I'm going to close here, but <laughs> it's going to take a minute. <laughs> healing all who were oppressed by the devil. See, sometimes the problem is that we don't know what the problem is. Like I mentioned about cigarettes for me. I thought I just needed to quit cigarettes. And I, and I believed, oh, someone might not like this. And I believed what the world says. Well, you know, nicotine's addictive. So now you're addicted. And so now, you know, it's physical. And, and there may be some truth to that. So I would use self-control, and I would stop, and I, whatever, and it didn't work. I believed that. But then one day, as I shared with you, the Lord laid down the truth for me. Just drop me some doctrine. And that's all it took. I knew the truth, and I could solve that truth because I knew this. For sure, I don't want to be like, uh, would I be worshiping a spirit of anger? Like, would I be willing to do that? I'm not willing. No matter how much I want a cigarette, not willing. So I was set free because the truth set me free. No longer believing that it's merely physical or whatever you believe. We must understand what we're dealing with. The Bible teaches us the truth and what we're dealing with. But for some of us, we have gone after the wrong problem. We're trying to solve a spiritual problem with earthly remedies. It will not work. This last week, the rains, I, I know you guys had some rains. I was talking to Pastor Jeff, and I think it was hailing while I was talking to him on the phone. I was like, wow. Some, okay, well, we had some really heavy rains. And in my house, uh, I, I recently moved into a new house uh, several months ago, which we love, uh, even though when it rained really hard, all of a sudden our roof leaked. We have a, like a flat terrace roof over one area of our house. Uh, which sounds great in theory until there's water on it and it's coming through your, uh, the, the living room. Um, and so the property manager had uh, the roofer come out. They've already done a roof thing there, but she had him come back out. And so he said, this is what we're going to do. You know, we'll lay this other roof and we'll, you know, do that. And thankfully, my property manager is also my sister, and she's quite wise uh, and willing 
to figure out problems instead of just thinking that's the answer. She said, yeah, I just, I feel like, I don't know. what. I don't know if it's that. I think it might be this. So she, she's like, I want to run some tests. And she don't have, she's like, I don't even know who will do this, so I'm going to have to do it. And she said, I'm going to have your son help me. We're going to figure this out. So she literally, I know, this is, I'm thinking, who does this? My sister. Uh, but it's good. So she comes and she decides to seal up the drains that are up there and literally run a hose to, f- like, fill the roof. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, Okay. So she says, we're going to see, like, is it seeping through? Like, where is it coming? We're going to know if there's a leak. So she does that. Nothing leaks. She says, okay, there's this, this stucco part back here where the roof meets, you know, the, the stucco wall. And she says, so I'm going to flood that, or I think it could be getting out under there. And so she floods that. Now, mind you, we have these things downstairs in the house to catch water because we know, right, she's trying to flood the house. And my, my mother and my son were, they were all aware of this. And uh, they were there, you know. And uh, so that, nothing, didn't leak. So she finally pulls the tape off the drains. <laughs> and it starts leaking. So why am I telling you this? You could put 100 roofs on that roof, and you weren't going to solve the problem. That leak wasn't the roof. It was the drains. Something in the drains were disconnected or something. So when the water goes through the drains, somewhere they get out. So now we got to f- solve that. But we could have paid to have 100 roofs put on there. And it would not have stop- stopped the leak. And you can go to 100. Hey, and I'm not against uh, anything like AA and all these things. You can, but I'll tell you right now, you can go to 1,000 meetings. But if you don't get free, you're not going to be free. You're going to stay bound. You may have some support and do better, but God wants more than that for you. He wants you free and full of joy. He don't want to just stop your bad behavior. God is not after behavior modification. Does everybody know that? I'm telling you, someone in here is going to get free from that. Not really, because that is no fun. God is not a fun sucker. He's not trying to suck the fun out of your life. He's not trying to get you to just do what he said because you need to. And he's certainly not just trying to get you to change your behavior. Although some of your behavior needs to change because it's destroying your life. God is after you becoming fully free, fully aware that you are the righteousness of Christ, that you are powerful, and that you are valuable. I mean, I don't know about you, but as a woman... I would never submit myself to an a abusive relationship ever again, although I would have before. Why? Because I'm Mrs. Jesus Christ. The God of the whole universe died for me. You think I'm going to let you treat me bad? No way. The truth sets you free. And so today, I've merely come to preach a message that you've already heard. But may you continue to let the gospel be preached to you and through you until every area of your life is subdued in the name of Jesus. And every area that is under subjection to darkness and despair and frailty and poverty, you must be loosed. You must go free because Jesus has paid for it. And the spirit of the living God is upon him. And it's upon me. And I've come to preach the gospel and to teach you that God handled it all. And that he still lives. And he still heals. And he still restores. And nothing is too hard for him. Behold, he is the God of all flesh. There's nothing too hard for him. And so today as we close, would you just speak to the Lord and tell him there's nothing too hard for you. Oh, Lord, there's nothing too hard for you. With your own words, tell him there's nothing too hard for you. 
those giants, those circumstances that you see right now in your heart. Take a good look because in the name of Jesus, we command those mountains to be moved. We command poverty and lack to be obliterated in the generosity of Jesus and of the Father who so loved us that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would not perish, but we would have eternal life. We will not perish in our emotions. We will not perish in our finances. We will not perish in our health. Lord, we welcome you to break chains. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And the Lord is speaking in this room, and he's saying, come to me. Come to me, all you weary, heavy laden. I long to give you rest. It's my good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's my heart's desire to see you well. I am willing be healed. Thank you, Jesus. And so, Lord, I ask that not one word mentioned of your name would fall on stony ground, but that every word Every word, I ask that it would be like oil poured forth and that it would bring healing and that every person in this place, that your word of faith would remain on them like an anointing oil, like an antibiotic that causes recovery. And I declare every person in this place free, whole, and delivered from every oppression in Jesus' name.